going to have a reading of scripture, and so I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Our sister Donnie is going to be reading for us. Let's read Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. For indeed, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant evildoers will be chaff. The coming day will burn them up, says the Lord of heaven's armies. It will not leave them even a root or branch. But for you who respect my name, the sun of vindication will rise with healing wings, and you will skip about like calves released from the stall. You will trample on the wicked, for they will be like ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I am preparing, says the Lord of heaven's armies. This is the word of God. Amen. In your bulletin, there's an outline. And on that outline, there's a QR code. That will take you to our Facebook page where we have the sermon manuscript posted through the blog. That may be helpful, for, helpful to you to read through especially as we'll be talking about a little bit more of a controversial topic as we look at the day of the Lord, the day of Christ's coming, and there are various different views on this issue. And so for some of you, you may be somewhat unfamiliar with some of these things, so it may be very helpful to be reading along as we go through this message. <clears throat> and please pray for me and my little voice. I've been had a, just a minor sickness since last Sunday, and it really hasn't gone away. Um, scratchy, scratchy. Um, throat and things like that. What is the day of the Lord? And how should we prepare for it? In Malachi 4, 1 through, th 1 through 3, God has just responded to the post-exilic Jews' criticism of him in Malachi 3, 14 through 15. Uh, we talked about this last week. There they said this, you have said it is useless to serve God. How have we been helped by keeping his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord of heaven's armies? So now we consider the arrogant to be blessed. Indeed, those who practice evil are successful. In fact, those who challenge God escape. Just as a reminder, this is written during the time of after the exile. Uh, Israel had been unfaithful to the Lord, so he exiled the nation all the way to Babylon. After 70 years, they started to return to <coughs> Israel, rebuild their land, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the, uh, rebuild the temple. However, uh, they were, there were still many things going wrong for them. Uh, they were still under the power of the Persian king. Persia had conquered Babylon, therefore they were under the thumb of the Persian king. They had many nations surrounding them that were harassing them, Samaritans that were harassing them. And so they were struggling with, we're, we're pe God's people, we're being faithful to the Lord. Why are things going bad for us? And so many of them had become discouraged in their faith. Many of them had become disillusioned with God. Why are they blessed? Why are they prospering? And why are we suffering? And so throughout this book, there are basically six disputations. This is the last one. Six disputations where Malachi, or God through Malachi, would give a statement about them uh, and then then he would give the reply that the, that the, that the Jews would, would come back with. Um, and so sometimes he's called the Hebrew Socrates because there's all these question answers happening within the book. But he's pointing out different ways that they have failed God in their offerings. Uh, they were giving the blind and the lame. Uh, they were criticizing God because of the prosperity of the nations around them. And so this, at least Malachi 3, 14 through 15, is the last disputation, the sixth disputation, and in Malachi 4, 1 through 3 and through 6 is basically God's answer. Um, so I'll read Ma Malachi 3, 14 through 15. I don't think I've read this already. My mind's not working correctly. You have said it's useless to serve God. How have we been helped by keeping his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord of heaven's armies? So now we consider the arrogant to be blessed Indeed, those who practice evil are successful, and those who challenge God escape. And so God answers their criticism by pointing to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, the time of the Messiah's coming to bring justice and judgment, is mentioned four times at the end of Malachi, 317, 4.1, uh, 4.3, and 4.5. 
Throughout Old Testament prophetic literature, the day of the Lord was any time that God judged people for their sins. For example, in the book of Obadiah, it refers to when God would judge Edom. And in the book of Joel, it refers to a locust plague that would come upon Israel. And in Isaiah, it refers to the destruction of Babylon. However, those smaller judgments were simply preludes for the final judgment uh, which Malachi is talking about in this passage and new, the New Testament points to as well. The final day of the Lord is when Christ comes to the earth to judge it and make all things right. Therefore, God was saying to these Jews who were criticizing, it seems like the wicked are blessed and those who are faithful suffer. He's saying, there's going to come a day where God is coming, and it's coming soon, where God will judge the wicked and the righteous will be rewarded and vindicated before everybody. Consequently, the, the, the disillusioned post-exilic Jews should fear the Lord, commit to the word of God, and prepare for that coming day, even as we should as well. In this time of delay, where we wait for, at that, time, at that point, they were waiting for the first coming, but the first coming was Christ dying for the sins of the world and providing forgiveness, a way of salvation, and ultimate judgment waits for the second coming. In this time of delay... In this time of delay, we'll at times suffer for righteousness, just as they were, they were, while the wicked prospers and gets their own reality TV shows. We may be disillusioned with our faith. We'll have times we may be angry at God when we see the corruption that at times happens in our churches. Some may be even tempted to fall away, deconstruct because of how bad things are in the house of God and how bad things are in the world. For this reason, we also must have a good understanding for this coming day and live with an expectation for it, the same prophecies that God gave post-exilic Jews. It'll be a time of tragic judgment, but also of exuberant blessing. It's a day with both night, night referring to the judgment, and day referring to the blessing. In this study, we'll consider principles about the day of the Lord and how to prepare for it. And today, we're only gonna look at one, this is a two-part sermon. So this will take us through our time. The day of the Lord, first point, the day of the Lord is happening soon, and therefore we must be alert and ready. We must be alert and ready, Malachi 4.1. For indeed, the day is coming. When he says this, he, he aims to assure the discouraged post-exilic Jews of this reality and that it would happen soon. No doubt this was not a new concept for them, just like it may not be a new concept for many of us here, here as well. It was one that they had heard about many times from the priests, the Levites, probably even their parents, that there would be a Messiah that would come from the Jews and bring justice that they had been waiting for. However, they either doubted it, simply ignored the promises of its coming, or had become apathetic to it. Through Malachi's warning, he hoped to sharpen their conscience in the same way the hope is that ours would be sharpened this morning so they would repent of sin, develop an alertness for this coming day, and faithfully follow the Lord while they waited for it. Likewise, Christ taught his followers, you and me, to live in an awareness of this day, in the light of this day as well. He compared it to the judgment of Noah's flood and to a thief in the night in Matthew 24. Both illustrations were meant to show how most people would not be ready for the coming day, including many of those who profess to be believers. They would not be ready for this coming day. Matthew 24, 37 through 44, Christ said this, For just like the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and took them all away. It'll be the same at the coming of the Son of Man. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one left. There will be two women grinding grain with the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay alert because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night 
the thief was coming, he would have been alert and would not have let his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. When he compares this to the flood, that people be eating, drinking, giving in marriage, and then all of a sudden they were swept away into this impending danger. In the same way, when Christ comes, the wicked, the judgment will come upon the wicked and they will be swept away. There will be two in the field working. The wicked will be swept away in the judgment while the righteous remain. Now, some have unfortunately wrongly used this passage to refer to the rapture of the saints, meaning that a believer will be taken away and the wicked will be left. But it's clear the context is referring to the flood. Uh, no one his family gets into the ark, and it's the wicked that are flat, swept away. And he says it'll be the same when he comes. So this is referring to the judgment of the wicked, clearly because of the comparison to the flood. The righteous will stay on the earth to be rewarded and rule with Christ. Therefore, we must be alert because the time is crumbing. Christ will come like a thief in the night. Now, with that said, and this is where we're going to jump into the weeds um, and so for some of you, you'll be very aware of this. Some of you, this will be a new concept. I ask you to try to um, stay along, and this will hopefully prompt you to study this deeper. With that said, there has been some debate about the nature of Christ coming. With the thief, there are typically no signs of his coming. He steals when people least expect it. However, with the second coming, Scripture describes various signs that will happen before it. For instance, Matthew 24, 14, like the gospel being preached in every nation of the world, the arrival of the Antichrist who will deceive the world, place an idol in the Jewish temple, and then begin to persecute the Jews and Christians who refuse to follow him. For example, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5, um, these, uh, these Thessalonians seem to be af afraid that they were already in the judgment period, the time of the tribulation in uh, the writer says this, or Paul says this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or by a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord, this time of judgment, has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that I was still with you? I told you these things. Paul describes a great rebellion. This seems to refer to a great falling away that will happen in the church, Matthew 24, uh, Christ describes how there will be false teachers and many people that will claim to be Christ and persecution will be hated by every nation for his namesake, another aspect of the signs, and there, the love of many would grow cold. And so during this time frame, there will be many deconstructions. Many people who all of a sudden are wrestling with Scripture, well, I don't believe that, and that seems very harsh and falling away. And uh, because of the pressure of the world, there will be many that will fall away from the church during this time. No doubt that's already beginning today. It's becoming a very normal cultural, uh, cultural phenom. Believers falling away, deconstructing, posting it on YouTube and their, their uh, Instagram page. Well, this will seem to be even worse right before, um, right before Christ comes. And what we're seeing now is just a preparation. We're just getting closer. Because of the exaltation of evil, pervasive false teaching, and persecution, um, many will fall away. The Antichrist will also appear and exalt himself as God in the Jewish temple. I believe this refers to a third temple that's being pushed to be rebuilt now in Israel. And so many believers are looking towards that as a major sign. These will happen before the coming Christ and therefore are signs that his coming is near. For unbelievers, Christ um, for unbelievers, Christ will come like a thief. But for believers who study God's word and serve him, they will be ready and expect his coming. It will not be like a thief to them because the signs will be very clear. We're looking at scripture and seeing these things being fulfilled before us today. Because of these necessary signs, 
Many would say, and this is where we get into some theological debate, where Bible-believing people who love the Lord will disagree, but I'm just going to make you aware of this debate. Many will say Christ's coming is impending, meaning it could happen soon. Instead of imminent, it could happen at any moment. I was raised in a church that taught Christ could come at any moment, um, and so we need to be ready. But others would say because of these signs, the being hated by all nations for his name's sake, which probably hasn't happened fully yet, the gospel going to every nation of the world, that there are signs that must happen, and therefore it's impending, everything could happen within our generation. So there's debate amongst believers. Now, those who would say that Christ could come, his coming is imminent, meaning it could happen at any moment, they typically believe that the second coming is two events. One invisible coming where Christ raptures his church and takes them to heaven right before the tribulation period or during the tribulation period. There's different views about that. And then a visible coming where he comes with his saints to judge the earth. To come to this conclusion, they point to various biblical evidences. One, like God's first judgment of the world through the flood. They would say God raptured a man named Enoch uh, many years before this flood. His great-grandson, Noah, and his family, they went through the judgment on an ark, and so there's a rapture, and then there are some believers that will go through the judgment. And so they'd look at the first judgment of the world and say it's going to be very similar to the second judgment, a group that will go and a group that will go through. And obviously, Scripture commonly compares them, even Matthew 24, compares the first judgment, the flood, to the second judgment that will come when Christ comes. But second, they also point to differences in the description of the second coming that might be best satisfied by two separate comings, they would say. For example, in John 14, Christ promises that he will return and take believers to the Father's house or to heaven. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 describes this rapture, that there will be a trumpet sound, believers will go straight up into the air, um, while other scriptures um, show Christ coming with believers to the earth to judge and rule. Revelation 19, 11 through 16, believers come to judge and rule. Jude chapter 1 uh, talks about Enoch prophesying about the second coming before the first coming. I see his saints coming with him to judge. And so at the rapture, believers are taken from the earth to heaven while non-believers stay on the earth. However, at the second coming, like we just read in Matthew 24, it's the wicked that are taken from the earth into the judgment while the believers stay on the earth as described in Matthew 24, 37 through 42, when Christ compares this to a flood. Again, for some, they see these differences in the text describing the second coming or the day of the Lord as best reconciled by two separate comings, one, visible, one invisible uh, for his saints and one visible um, coming with his saints to judge the world. Now, others, now this has been the most popular view throughout history, others reconcile the differences in prophecy by saying Christ fulfills them all with one coming. For example, at his coming, saints will be raptured up to heaven, meet with Christ in the air, and then they will come immediately down to judge. That's been the most popular view throughout history. Um, however, in the last century or so, the two-coming view has probably eclipsed it, at least in popularity. Obviously, there are lots of books and movies, the Left Behind series, etc., that has helped with this popularity of this view. The weakness of the one-coming view is that Christ does not take his followers to the Father's house as initially promised. That's what would be said. Um, they just immediately meet him in heaven and come straight down. There's no going to the Father's house for a season, as John 14 seems to describe. Uh, he returns with them to rule and usher in his kingdom. However, after this, what I would take the view of the millennial kingdom, heaven, the Father's house, will come to the earth in Revelation 21. A weakness of the two-coming view is that no one text clearly describes it. No one text clearly describes it. It comes from comparing many different texts and the implications of these texts. While many of the Many of the texts on the second coming seem to be one event. For instance, Matthew 24, when he describes the, uh, the, all the false teachers, people falling away from the faith, all these uh, events like earthquakes and different things happening, 
that it very clearly seems to be one coming there. If you read 1 Thessalonians 4, describing the rapture, it seems to be one coming. If you read Revelation 19, it seems to be one coming, Christ coming with his saints. And so one comes from comparing them. Uh, another one, again, comparing them, Matthew 24, it's the unbelievers that are swept away. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it's the believers that are going up to heaven. And they look at these differences and say, maybe this is best pictured by two different comings, as well as some other arguments. Again, this is just an introduction. With that said, one strength of the two coming view is how the Old Testament scriptures of the first coming similarly hid the second coming. Let me say that again. A strength of the two coming view is how the Old Testament scriptures of the first coming similarly hid the second coming. For instance, most rabbis in reading the Old Testament were confused in the differences about the prophecies about the Messiah. How could he be born of a virgin, and yet in Daniel 7, he's coming in the sky? How does that work out? How could, he, how could Christ come in the clouds to reign, and yet die and be buried in a rich man's tomb? So some ra rabbis rationalized this and said, maybe there's two different messiahs instead of two different comings. Again, Old Testament prophecies of the first coming blurred the second coming, which is part of the reason I believe that many people rejected them. They couldn't reconcile this one that was coming to rule, and yet he comes from the ghetto. How is he going to come to rule and the government rests on his shoulder, and he comes from Galilee, right? No education. This doesn't fit and so I think that's part of the reason not properly reconciling the differences in the Old Testament prophecies that probably led to at least some rejecting him. Many believe the same about prophecies about the second coming in the New Testament, that there will be, in fact, two comings. Those who believe that the, coming, the second coming will be two events, an invisible coming for, his, for believers and a visible coming with believers for judgment, Say Christ's coming is imminent, uh, that it could happen at any moment. No signs are needed to precede Christ's coming right now for his church to take them straight to heaven. This is a strength of that view. It seems that the early church believed Christ could come at any moment. In fact, we know at the Thessalonians, many of them had stopped working and were leaning on everybody else to take care of them because they believed he could come at any moment. So they said, well, why are we working? They didn't read the parable of the talents, that God expects you to be working when he comes. And he's going to reward you based on your faithful servant. Had a bad theology, but it's very clear that many believe that he could come at any moment. For example, in James 5, 8 through 9, James says this, You also be patient. I left this part of the verse on an accident. You also be patient and strengthen your hearts, for the Lord's return is near. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge stands before the gates. It pictures Christ about to swing the doors open to judge those who were gossiping about one another, who were grumbling about the leaders in the church. If the grumblers thought, oh, the gospel has to get to every nation and we'll be every nation first and we've got to be hated by all different nations and the Antichrist has to rise first, the warning would lack the force that James seemed to project by this illustration. That the door could open at any moment, it seems to picture. Likewise, 1 John 2, 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. They believed that he could come during their lifetime. And Hebrews 10, 37, For just a little longer, and he who is coming will arrive and not delay. And 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Many seem to believe that the early church believed that the, the Christ could come at any moment, and therefore they were encouraged to live in light of that. Now, with that said, others would say that you can take these passages and they can just as easily be applied the Bible can be translated in every generation within our nation, and the gospel can go to every nation. That things can happen where we'll be hated as Christians by all nations. All of these convinced can happen within our nation 
and within our time frame, and therefore the coming is impending. It can happen in our generation, so we should always be prepared. Where others would say, it can happen at any moment. That view can only come if you believe that the rapture does not need any signs. So therefore, there's a division amongst Christians on this view. Either way, whether we believe the second coming is one event, which is the majority view throughout history, um, that it's impending, or you believe that it's two events, and therefore can happen at any moment, Scripture teaches us all that we must be all alert and ready for His coming. For unbelievers, it will come like a thief. They're not going to be ready at all. But for those of us that are studying God's Word and looking at the signs, we should not be overtaken as a thief. Now, with that said, at the back of your bulletin or the back of your outline, I put a QR code. If you want to study this more, unfortunately, we can't go into the different views of the rapture deeply. I have written a book that's free on Bible.org. You can click that link, and you can go to look up the rapture view. And I think the arguments are strong on both sides. So that's some homework for you. Now we're going to move on. With all that said, it's clear there was skepticism about the first coming amongst the post-exilic Jews, as there is today. Which is why twice at the end of the letter... And Malachi 3, 1 through 5, and Malachi 4, 1 through 6, that Malachi emphasizes this. Listen to Malachi 3, 1 through 5. I apologize. I don't think I put this up there. I am about to send my messenger who will clear the way before me. Indeed, the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant whom you long for is certainly coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can keep standing when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will act like a refiner and purifier of silver and will cleanse the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will offer the Lord a proper offering. The offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in former times and years past. I will come to you in judgment. I will be quick to testify against those who practice divination, those who commit adultery, those who break promises, and those who exploit workers, widows, and orphans who refuse to help the resident foreigner. And in this way, show that they do not fear me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The repeated warnings of the Messiah's coming in Malachi was meant to confront the skepticism the doubting that the God of justice was coming. In Malachi 2.17, they said, where is the God of justice? And they said, those who sinned would not be judged. And so he's confronting their unbelief through the coming of the Messiah. Likewise, Scripture tells us, there will also be continued and increasing skepticism about the second coming in our generation and future ones as we get close to the time that Christ comes. 2 Peter 3.3, 3, Peter says this, Above all, understand this, in the last days, blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges, and saying, Where is his promise return? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. As we get closer to Christ's coming, skepticism towards it will continue to increase. Most likely, this is not referring to unbelievers because unbelievers don't believe it in the first place. Most likely, this will happen or come from the disillusioned in the church. Why do, why do the pastors steal the money in the church? And why is my parents, they tell me to come to church, but their lifestyle at home is nothing like what they claim to when they go to church on Sunday. There are so many disillusioned Christians, just like there was, during the day of Malachi. Why do the evil prosper and the good seems like things are hard for them? In many cultures, we have friends that, from Pakistan that are believers. And in Pakistan, the Christians all work the manual labor jobs. Why are, why are we the poor ones in society? And the others, the Muslims, they prosper. And so many today struggle with skepticism as well as they look around the church. And probably also referring to those who have deconstructed from the church. The ones that said, where is the God of justice? Is there a God of justice? The church doesn't do justice, they say. And they've deconstructed from the church. 
So this skepticism seems to be from those who profess to believe, who may be disillusioned, and those who have fallen away. Like those during Noah's time, people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage when Christ comes. There is nothing wrong with these activities in themselves, but when done without an awareness, a devotion, and submission to God, they're wrong. That's what was happening during Noah's time. They had no fear of God, no worship of God. Many will doubt the repeated warnings of Christ's return in Scripture or simply live with no care or awareness for it. While they go to school, while they eat and drink in mom's kitchen or 12 baskets, they'll have no thought about these things. They're just living their life as though there's not a judgment coming that we should be aware of and living for and that we want him to be pleased with when he comes. Most will be just going about their daily lives. In Matthew 24, 48 through 51, Christ said something similar about his coming and using the illustration of an evil servant overseeing his master's home while the master was away. He said this, But if that evil slave should say to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with the drunkards. Then the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not foresee and will cut him in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because many in the church, he's talking about servants, those who proclaim to be servants, Many in the church will doubt Christ's coming or live with no acknowledgement of it. They will begin to live in waste. Eating and drinking refers to waste here. Discord with others and various sins. They're getting drunk with everybody else. Others will just simply live in spiritual apathy. No fervency in their spiritual life. No fear of sin. No desire to see the kingdom of God come. Spiritual apathy will define them because they have no awareness of the coming of our king. We also saw this. In the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Five virgins were foolish, five were wise. As they waited for the bridegroom to return, referring to Christ, the five foolish ones had no oil in their lamps because they stopped expecting his return. They were spiritually apathetic. They tried to hurry and get oil, but were kept out of the wedding party when they saw that the, 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 the bridegroom was coming. When they knocked at the door to get in, the bridegroom, who represents Christ, simply says, I don't know you. Christ ends the parable by saying, therefore, stay alert because you do not know the, time, the, know the day or hour that he will come. Those who are truly born again will live for their master. They will be known, Christ said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do my father's will. There will be many evil servants. Many will call him Lord, but they will not be identified by a lifestyle of obedience. They'll have no oil. People will look at them and be like, man, is there any Holy Spirit in this person's life? Any desire to please God? Any desire to see others saved? Is there anything happening in this person's life at all? Christ says, these people, he will say to them, I don't know you. I don't know you. Likewise, we must, be, we must seek to be good stewards of all of our gifts and keep our spiritual fires burning as we await our Lord's return as well, because he is coming soon. That's what Malachi is trying to get, the disillusioned believers, those who profess to be believers during this time. He's coming soon. You better get ready, because he's going to start with you. He's going to judge the Levites and the priests. He's starting with you. <coughs> Are we living with the zealous expectation of our Lord's return? Are we living with no expectation, and therefore being unfaithful with our stewardship of our gifts, stewardship of our family, stewardship of our relationships, living in discord with fellow servants that we noted by being angry and unforgiving towards our brothers and sisters in Christ because we don't believe he's coming? Are we living or are we living with a spiritual zeal instead of a spiritual apathy? Living with alertness of his soon return will keep us away from sin and spiritual apathy and according to the parable of the virgins and the parable of the, the evil servant, it's also the one who's living as though he's coming is the one who's truly born again. And those who don't, he says, I'll just say to them, I don't know you, and they'll be judged. 1 John 3, 2-3 says this, 
Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who believes in this coming, everyone who's living for it, they will be identified by purifying their language. They'll be purified by seeking to live in peace with others as much as is possible with them. They'll be, they'll, be, they'll be known by trying to be holy for the Lord. Everyone who has this hope, they purify themselves and live for this coming. Again, as seen with the parable of the virgins and the evil servant, a lack of alertness, a lack of soberness um, is seen, at least in these parables, as a proof of a lack of true salvation, a lack of proof that Christ knows us and that we know him. There's no oil, no zeal for the coming bridegroom. Now, why has, question for us, why has Christ delayed his return and judgment? Why has Christ delayed his return and judgment? With the post-exilic Jews, they had to wait over 400 years, around probably 460 years for Christ to come. And when he did, the nation rejected him and killed him. When he came, he brought salvation through his death on the cross for our sins, but not the final judgment. Again, prophecies in the Old Testament of the first coming and second coming, they were commonly put together. It's like he was going to come and judge, and he did judge. He judged sin in his own body, but the ultimate judgment waits the second coming. So there was a confusion when you saw these prophecies together. Um, at least many people did not recognize it as two. I don't know if any did. Um, two separate comings. Currently, we have, they waited 400 and something years. Malachi was written around like 434 B.C. Christ dies about 80, 33, so again, 460 years. Currently, we have waited over 2,000 years since Christ's first coming and, him, uh, and it's coming for him to return, judge, reward, and rule. 2 Peter 3.9 said this about the reason Christ delays his return. It says this, The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient towards you, because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Christ delays, not because of a lack of integrity, or laziness in completing God's call in his life. He delays because he desires for none to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Both those who are outside of the church who have never heard the gospel, and those with no oil who call him Lord inside the church. He says he does this for you. Um, he's being patient toward you, speaking to the people in uh, the Roman Empire, Christians in the Roman Empire. He's being patient toward you. No doubt there were some without oil amongst them as well, and those who needed oil to be faithful to share the gospel. He delays because he desires for none to perish. Therefore, as we wait, we must not only be alert and faithful stewards, but we also must be diligent in sharing the gospel and winning people to Christ. We also must be diligent to test ourselves to make sure that we're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourself. See if you are in the faith. Unless you fail the test and Christ is not really in you, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Christ delays so more will be saved. However, one day, the last person will accept Christ and God in Christ will come to judge the world. Are we living with alertness for Christ's coming, including faithful stewardship uh, and spiritual evangel evangelistic zeal? We must get ready Scripture promises reward for those who set their affection on his coming. 2 Timothy 4.8, before Paul dies, this is his last book he writes before he's beheaded in Rome, he says this, Finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for me. The Lord, the righteous judge, will award it to me in that day, referring to the day he comes, and not to me only, but also to all who have set their affection on his appearing. All those who have set their affection, that should be all of us, living for that day when he comes. Have we set our affection on his coming? Now, we're going to close with this with several application points. How can we live with an alertness and readiness for Christ's soon return? How can we live with an alertness and readiness 
for Christ's soon return. Here's the first point. To live with an alertness and readiness for Christ's return, we must faithfully gather with other believers for worship, prayer, and to take the Lord's Supper. We must faithfully gather with other believers for worship, prayer, and to take the Lord's Supper. Consider the following verses. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning our own meetings, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so, as we see the day drawing near. He expects that they'll be watching. They're not going to be taken like a thief in the night. Because the believers know. They've read Matthew 24. They've read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They're very aware of the signs. So they're not living in apathy, marrying and drinking and taking classes with no thoughts about it. They know. And so they see the day approaching. And how much more should we gather as we see evil becoming pervasive in our societies and in our governments? We should be faithfully gathering even more so. 1 Peter 4, 7. For the culmination of all things is near. So be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of prayer. This is a season as we see the ungodliness becoming normative in our nation, and our nations. People don't even know what gender is anymore in our, in our countries. As we see these things happening, we should be even more faithful in prayer, not simply going to class and eating and drinking, but praying even more as we see the day approaching. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is not simply a memorial where we look back, but it's also a looking forward to the fact that he's coming again. As we gather for worship, prayer, communion, we gain mutual encouragement to be faithful for our Lord, for our master who's coming. The bridegroom, and we are the bride, we gain mutual encouragement to be ready for the time that he comes. Instead of spiritually as lethargic, caught in various sins with no desire, never setting our affection on his coming. Second, to live with an alertness and readiness for Christ's return, we must faithfully and zealously serve God and others. We must faithfully and zealously serve God and others. In the parable of the talents, in Matthew 25, 19 through 23, Christ describes his return and rewarding of those who faithfully use their gifts in his absence. I'll go ahead and read it for us. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled his accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came and brought five more, saying, Sir, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master answered, Well done, good and faithful slave. You've been faithful in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one with two talents also came and said, Sir, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've gained two more. His master answered, Well done, good and faithful slave. You've been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Likewise, after teaching about believers, about the believer's resurrection at the second coming, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So then, dear brothers and sisters, be firm. Do not be moved by the craziness that's happening in your society. Do not be moved by the circumstances that are happening in your life. Do not be moved. Always be outstanding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because Christ is coming soon, we must always be outstanding in using and cultivating our gifts to serve others and honor God. When we are not faithfully serving and using our gifts, we won't desire his coming. In fact, as Christ taught, if we're not faithfully using our gifts when he comes, we're going to experience a loss of reward. The person with one talent is the talent is removed. Someone once said, uh, I heard this story about, what's the name of this pastor? William Hendrickson. I think his name is William. Craig Smith can correct me. William, William Hendrickson. He was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And a student had come into his office one day and said, hey, Sir, I think I'm going to quit seminary. I believe Christ is coming soon, and so I need to go get on the mission field and start working now. And he simply looked at him and said, if you would do anything different today, uh, if, you know, if you knew that Christ was coming, then you would do, if he wasn't coming, then you need to go do that. Meaning that 
if we should know that God has called you to be here as a student, and he will, he will reward you for being a faithful student, and God has called you to maybe be here as an English teacher or as a staff, and you should be faithful doing it when he comes because that's part of your stewardship. We've all been called to be faithful whatever he's given us so we can offer that to him. I did my best to honor you, to be a light in the classroom, to be a light at my workplace, to raise up godly kids that we should, not, we should be doing what we are doing if we believe Christ would return soon. Third, to live with an alertness and readiness for Christ's return, we must continually get rid of sin in our lives and within the body of believers. We must continually get rid of sin in our lives and within the body of believers. 1 John 3, 2 through 3, John said this to the Ephesians. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. They get rid of sin. Also, in the context of the judgment and the renewal of the earth in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, Peter said this, since all these things are to melt away in this manner, the first judgment was through water, the final judgment will be through fire as he, re as he renews the earth. Since all these things are to melt away in this manner, what sort of people must we be conducting our lives in holiness and godliness while waiting for and hastening, as we pray no doubt, hastening the coming of the day of God? Therefore, dear friends, since you are waiting for these things, strive to be found in peace in your relationships with others, without spot or blemish, when you come into his presence. If we know he's coming, what type of lives should we live if we know he's coming soon? Nothing dulls our spirituality more than unconfessed, unrepented sin. When we're walking in unrepentant sin, we will not desire for our Lord to come because of our enjoyment of that sin and the shame in doing so. So one of the things we must do, if we're going to stay alert, if we're going to stay alert, we must get rid of sin. Um, in considering our need to be alert and eager and ready for Christ's coming, Wayne Grudem, a person who wrote a famous systematic theology, the best systematic theology in my opinion, uh, comments on this challenge. He said this, Do Christians, in fact, eagerly long for Christ's return? The more Christians are caught up in enjoying the good things of this life, and the more they neglect genuine Christian fellowship and their personal relationship with Christ, the less they will long for his return. On the other hand, many Christians who are experiencing suffering or persecution or who are more elderly, it's the benefit of getting older, more elderly and infirm, and those whose daily walk is vital and deep, will have a more intense longing for his return. To some extent then, the degree to which we actually long for Christ's return is a measure of the spiritual condition of our own lives at that moment. Ask yourself, how much do you long for the coming of your Lord and Savior? That is a measure of where you are currently at, at this moment, spiritually. Do you long for him to make things right in a society that are unjust? Do you long for him to gather his saints and reward them and to live in peace and joy? As you get older, do you long for a new body? I know I do. I'd like to stand up when I preach again. Um, do you long for the coming of your Lord? The day of the Lord is coming soon, and we must be alert and ready for it. This is what God was seeking to inspire in the post-exilic Jews who were disillusioned with their faith as they looked around at the prosperity of the wicked and probably desired it, and the suffering of the righteous. This isn't fair, they thought. Without this eschatological view, we'll be prone to the same discouragements, disillusionment in our life when things are going wrong, and when we go into various failures. Are you longing for the coming of our Lord and Savior? I want to invite EPT up here. Next time we get together, we'll look at two other points to help us um, understand the day of the Lord and prepare for it. The day of the Lord is happening soon, and therefore we must be alert and ready. Are we ready? Here are some ways that we can pray in response. One of these is not up there, so I'll add this one to it. Pray for God to give us grace to confess our sins and let go of anything that is dulling our faith and desire for God. 
pray for grace to confess our sins and let go of anything that is dulling our faith and desire for God. That's one of the things that dulls us for his coming. Pray for God to give us grace to live with alertness, soberness, and zeal for Christ's coming. And that this zeal would cause us to be faithful stewards of his gifts as a student, as a professor, as a staff, as an English teacher, as a parent, faithful servants of the church, and faithful witnesses to the lost. Pray for God to come and bring justice and righteousness to our families, churches, cities, governments, and nations. And finally, pray for God to give us hearts that long for and constantly pray for Christ's coming. In fact, pray this. We're taught to pray this in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Our prayers are meant to help us be hot. Our prayers are meant to make us desire. He says this, we're called to pray this daily, just as we pray for our daily bread. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we see in Revelation 22 where they pray, come Lord Jesus, come. Let's spend some time in prayer, praying for the coming of our Lord, confessing our sin, praying that God would help us to be hot, praying for him to bring righteousness and justice, praying for him to save the lost. Let's spend some time in prayer. we know Christ is coming soon. If you could take some time to pray for any family members, any friends that don't know the Lord, uh, any believers that seem to be living without oil, that God would stir them up, stir them up that they would get on fire for the Lord and serve him with all their hearts. He would reveal their gifts and give them passion for his kingdom. Let's pray for those who don't know the Lord and those who are living as though he's not coming, that God will stir them up. Let's pray for one another. Go ahead and stand and close in prayer. Let's sing, but Lord, it's for thee.
verse 10 talks about our need to encourage one another and stir one another up towards righteousness much more as we see the day approaching. And one of the ways that we stir one another up towards righteousness is through prayer. I have a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility to me. You have a responsibility to the person on your left and right. And so if we could take a second and pray for them as a way to stir them up, pray, put your, if you feel comfortable, put your hand on their shoulder or just pray in your heart towards somebody in front of you. But pray for the people around you that God would set them free from anything that would be holding them back from loving God wholeheartedly, serving his church, and building up his kingdom in this world. Pray that God would stir them up towards a, uh, an affection. Paul talked about how God will reward those with a crown of righteousness who eagerly have this affection for the coming of Christ and that they would be faithful when the master comes, that he would say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant to those that are around you. As they use their gifts and as they bless their relationships, as they seek to be salt and light to all around. So pray for those around you, that they may be faithful when Christ comes. Father, we thank you that in the same way that you were challenging the post-exilic Jews who were disillusioned, some doubting that you were coming, and some who were faithful, who feared you, that you challenged them, encouraged them um, that you were coming soon. And so, Father, we thank you that you aim to challenge us this morning, the fact that you're coming soon, and encourage us as well. And so, Father, we ask that you'd help us to be faithful. We ask for those who are even unaware of what gifts that you have given them, that you would stir their gifts up in the flame, that you'd make them aware of the ways that you've called them to serve the church and reach out to the lost with gifts of evangelism and mercy and teaching and leadership and administration, that you'd use your people to be faithful stewards of the gifts that they have given, that you've given them, so they'll be faithful stewards when you come. And they can say, Lord, I've taken what you've given me, God, and here's what's in return. Father, we ask that not only will we be faithful individually, but as a church, that we be faithful as you come. And we pray along with the church around the world and the Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, come, Lord, come. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day and a good week.